All right, so we talked about before about how heavily indebted countries within a globalized trading structure tend to become suspicious of foreign elements and therefore foreign people to the extent the economy does not constantly grow. In other words, if you live in a country that is accepting foreign direct investment from other nations, which of course means that on some level that you are going to have some sort of immigration agreement between the two countries, if that agreement, if that trading structure is not beneficial for everyone, and if the country that is accepting foreign investment is not growing, is in a recession, there's a human tendency in history to blame outside influences. Now, we covered that. There's another quote from the 1960s that says the revolution will not be televised. It probably means a lot of things, but to me, what it means is that the political power structure, for the most part, is supported by existing media especially in a democracy. So whoever's in power uses their political influence to buy advertising or to generate a message that is consistent with their objectives. You can see how this would be hostile to outside influences in a, in a one-party state. And you can also see how, to the extent that you have legitimate competition in a country that has more than one viable political party, you can also see how allowing different messages to reach the same people can result in fragmentation and social division. So when I talk about the fact that revolution will not be televised, what I, what I take to mean from that statement is the fact that for the most part, media ownership dovetails with political power. And generally speaking, media ownership tends to be fairly concentrated. If you think about why that is, it should be fairly obvious, right? I mean, if you want to get your message out, you have to go through a technological spectrum that favors, or that, that is going to be given to you by a government, whether that's a radio spectrum, whether that's a Wi-Fi, a, a band from a satellite, you know, whether it's KA or something else, the government is in charge of doling out that spectrum. And so as a result, it's also in charge of figuring out who is going to most responsibly broadcast the news. And so, when we, when, so one of the things we have to understand is that in the United States, and not just here, but all over the world, we're dealing with concentrated media ownership which tells you that we're also dealing with concentrated property ownership. And the consequences of that are many, but for, my, for our purposes, I wanna focus on a couple of things that arise from that. One of the lessons that we've picked up from concentrated media ownership isn't only the fact that you're giving you know, the opportunity for outsiders to come in and report on the news to the extent that you're not, you know, divulging the news properly or objectively. That, of course, is the genesis behind the conservative, conservative Fox News Network in the United States, which is relatively new. The idea was that the media that was supporting the Democratic Party, the quote-unquote liberal political party, was not reporting the news properly. That was creating bias against the conservatives in this country. Give me one second. And as a result of that bias, there was an, an opening for people that were being either neglected or that were in a position where they were being maligned by the mainstream media. They were in a position where they could easily latch on to a competing network or networks. And to a great extent, that was true. That discrimination was true. 
the media, for the most part, on a national level, was not doing a good job and continues not to do a good job representing the American people. And that has led to further splits. And at the same time that concentration of ownership has resulted, you are also in a position where the ownership structure sort of mimics the real estate structure. It mimics almost everything, right? And you have a president that ran, that, that ran for the office, I think, two other times before finally getting it. So it tells you that you know, politicians are stand-ins for people who own property, whether that's stock, whether that's real estate, or whether that's shares in a media company. And so you can see how the media has a lot of power to shape the narrative. And so to the extent that you have competing interests, it's unlikely that the existing media is going to cover interests that are inimical to its own funding and its own backers. Now, you would assume that at some point, people would try to get along and try to create a system where they would be able to balance each other out. You know, we have that in the law. Within the law in the United States, we talk about an adversarial system that is supposed to create a better chance of finding out the truth. I think most people have given up on that notion, at least in, I mean, at least in practice. And so when, we, when we, we've applied that same structure to the media, and as a result, it hasn't necessarily gotten us anywhere closer to the truth. It's simply fragmented information and therefore political spectrums. Now, what's interesting to me is that as a result of this failure of cooperation, which is really the status quo trying to hold on to the narrative, one party states have managed to do a better job economically because they haven't had to focus on responding to a media that tends not to be objective or that, or that is in power, essentially to push a narrative that maintains its own existence. And this is particularly problematic in the United States where we've had issues with funding small media outlets. So for example, the, in the United States, we have one media outlet called NPR that's publicly funded. In the United Kingdom, they have the BBC. And it's not just one channel in the BBC, it's multiple channels. There's BBC, I mean, I think there's BBC Four, I mean, or at least there's Channel Four. All of that is not necessarily publicly funded, but for the most part, it creates a system where you have a better chance of getting news that is objective because it's not being funded by a corporation or a bank that's associated with the corporation. It's being funded by taxpayers through a tax. At least that's what happens in the, in the UK. In the United Kingdom, of course, you've got NPR, PBS, these so-called public channels. But for the most part, they're not something that most people watch. And that's unfortunate, but one of the reasons is because the programming is inconsistent. Uh, in recent years, a lot of the programming has focused on period pieces, which of course don't apply, don't, don't appeal to the entire country. Especially not a period piece about the United Kingdom, which again seems a bit odd, but it does make sense to the extent that the media empires between English-speaking Britain and English-speaking United States are collaborating. And in fact, a lot of the shows that are popular here are actually written by British writers. That would include Black Mirror. That would include a lot of the shows that you see. So one of the things in the United States that we've seen is that as the costs of journalism go up within a structure of concentrated media ownership in private hands, the information spectrum has become corrupted. And that, of, that of course, has created a lot of issues for the average voter, who at this point is probably voting based on how he or she feels about a candidate or about a party rather than something that's more objective or more 
verifiable. And again, that's not, that's not new, that's human nature. If, if you ask a jury who, who, that is trying to make a decision in a trial, in many cases, the jury will choose or issue a verdict based on the likability of the parties. If they like one side over the other, they're more likely to rule in that person's favor or that party's favor. So again, none of these things are new. Now, what I want to really focus on, actually, all this has been a buildup to the following, which is that there's been this slander within that element of xenophobia of concentrated media ownership in the hands of foreigners. And I want to explain how that comes about. First of all, remember that any sort of bias is based on some level in logic because we're all human beings, we're all subject to human nature. And so what's really been happening is that if you have a national media that comes out of, say, a place like New York, that national media is creating... Wait a little bit here. So that national media is showing you news articles that cater to you. It's, it could very well be that the feedback it's getting on its algorithms indicates that people in New York who have a higher percentage of Jewish residents compared to the rest of the country want to see more stories about a particular thing. And so it's able to engineer its algorithm to show people in New York those stories that, that cater to a specific group. That's what, by the way, that's what advertising targeting is. It's trying to figure out how to sell advertising by catering the news to people that, in ways that show them what they want to see or what they're interested in. And so you can see how a minority in New York that has no affiliation with the Jewish population, no direct affiliation, would turn on his or her television or go online and see stories that don't necessarily cater to him or her. And as a result, we generate a bias that so-and-so group controls the media. Now, remember that with websites and anything digital, all these things can be changed. So if I'm looking at the homepage of a news organization in California, you know, there's no guarantee that somebody on the West Coast looking at the same page is also gaining access to the same homepage, the same news stories. So for me, because I live in a city and a county that is dominant, dominated by, you could almost say controlled, by a Catholic political influence, a lot of the stories that I see on my news feed online uh, talk about the Pope, they talk about, you know, just a lot of things that don't necessarily apply to non-Catholics. And you can see how if someone like myself were, didn't understand any of these, how algorithms work or how advertising works, you can see how I would tend to believe that a lot of the media is quote unquote controlled by people who are favorable to the Catholic Church. And on some level that's true. You, you do see in many places the dovetailing of shows or propaganda with interests that are favorable to maintaining the tax exempt status of the Catholic Church, which is one of the largest landowners, not just in the United States, but all, all over the world. And part of that, of course, is really complex. It has to do with the fact that city governments have a propaganda budget. They don't call it that. They call it an advertising or marketing budget. In some cases, they call it a recruiting budget. But every police department, of course, has some sort of outreach program. And in the old days, that was something simple. It was just a gym that was probably run by the PAL, Police Activities League. Now, in order to get the message out on a local level, you know, the, the police budget includes on some level, you know, some sort of pro-police message. And that's actually one of the reasons why local newspapers have gone out of business because 
the extent that their message is conflicting with the local government's message, you can see how that would create a conflict, how advertisers might be inclined or would have to choose between a government local budget that advertises and some other budget that advertises an opposite message. It's in the same way that you know, when Coca-Cola goes to a store, a small convenience store on a local level, they give the owner a choice. You know, you can have a Coca-Cola vending machine over there or a Pepsi vending machine. You can't have both. And on some level, that's that marketing budget that is designed to shape a narrative, on some level, it succeeds, but it does so at a great cost. And so one of the reasons in the United States that we or all over the world, that we tend to have this narrative, this constant narrative or consistent narrative of certain groups controlling the media is simply based on a misunderstanding of algorithms and how advertising works. And what's really happening there is the algorithms are doing their job, but they're not doing their job in a way that necessarily makes sense because on a fundamental level, when you put all those factors together, you don't really have journalism to the extent that the journalism, that the stories are being dictated to you by either a viewpoint brought to you by a local government, especially a police budget or some other corporation that's, that caters to that specific government and has an interest in maintaining their contracts or their contacts, as opposed to what we had in the past, which was, say, something a little bit more sturdy. So when I was growing up, we would have on, on a national newspaper the best writers from all over the country. We would have something from the Miami newspaper, something from the Chicago newspaper. And so all of that would fund the news and would allow the news to go out whether, and basically publish stories that were meaningful. But it wasn't just that. You had also individual journalists like Studs Turkle. You had people that were associated with 60 Minutes uh, that were going across the country. You had a lot of news organizations that were actually reporting on the news, but in doing so were conflicting or creating conflicts between the message that the local government or the national government wanted to get out there and the message of the truth. And you know that because in many cases, you know that the cover-ups that have existed in, say, the Catholic Church is one example of the different, the billion-dollar judgments uh, against them, a billion-dollar judgment against them. You have the cover-up of, you know, child molestation within the ranks. You have essentially a program that could not have existed without some sort of complicity within the local law enforcement, as well as local media. And so that tells you right away that we're not dealing with something that's new. We're dealing with a concentration of, of ownership that all across the board, media, real estate, and politics, that tends to cater to the interests of its backers. But for our purposes, what we're trying to discuss now is why this idea of foreign ownership of the media tends to come up so often in, in human history. And the answer really is it doesn't come up unless the economy is doing poorly. And if the economy is doing poorly, and suddenly there's this idea that, you know, why am I seeing this news article about so-and-so, about some other group? You know, th this group must have control over something that has to do with my life. And nobody cares if they are doing well. It's only when, again, all these different fragmented systems start to fail that people start to care about foreign influence and therefore start to see, quote unquote, their neighbors, quote unquote, as the other. So that's really a short lesson in how all these things sort of come about. Um, you know, the other problem, of course, is that over time, if you don't have journalism, or if the journalism is strictly local, it's not necessarily helpful. So the journal, if you have a, an opposite scenario where the journalists are reporting on the truth, but nothing gets done. That may be just as bad as the scenario that we talked about. And, you know, because that will cause people to lose faith in their newspapers, it will cause funding issues for the newspapers, and so on and so forth. Now, overall, you can see how if the local newspaper is reporting on things that don't necessarily push forward the narrative in a way that is useful, that brings the country together together, 
towards a common, on a common fl platform, you can see how if it just reports on something fluff, like the local grocer, uh, you can see how over time, especially if the economy is not doing well, that things fall apart. I guess I'll end with, with another example. You know, this matters. All these things matter because the newspapers, the media, they really do control the language that we use and therefore our ability to communicate with each other. And you can see this just in the, in the way that the United States has adopted what to me is a pejorative term of Negro. And the word Negro actually is a Spanish word called for black, Negro. And <laughs> you, you notice that the, we don't talk about, you know, Blanco with the, when referring to white people uh, or people, people of German descent. But for the longest time, the narrative was shaped by this idea of a word that intrinsically judged people by their color first rather than anything else. And so it was used by every news organization. You can see how, again, what I just talked about, if you have a media that sort of repeats the same language, but without sort of trying to educate people about where that language comes from, you can see how that has consequences for the narrative. Even now we use the word with a capital B, black, to refer to the African-American population. We're able to do that even though we've had a lot more mixing in this country and therefore a lot more colors because Number one, for the most part, the African-Americans in this country come from the west coast of Africa. And so there isn't as much mixing as there is in Europe, in France, in Northern Africa, all, all places that are closer to Northern Africa, which was under Muslim influence and, you know, which went back and forth between different powers. And you can see how if you were growing up in Northern Africa, you couldn't use the word Negro or black because that's not what you would see. You would see lots of colors that, you know, quite frankly, can't be categorized. It's just one, when there are so many colors, it doesn't really mean anything, right? It's just, you know, it's, it's problematic in the United States when you only have really a few colors within the black spectrum or the African-American spectrum. And if you really couldn't get away with that in, you know, Northern Africa or even in Europe, it's in some places in Europe, because there's just, there are just too many colors. And you, you can see that with the British. The British came up with a word called swarthy, which was also pejorative. It meant not black, but not white, but something in between, um, but it had a negative connotation. So you can see where you put all these things together, language matters. Uh, and so to the extent that we're trying to try to figure out how to fix these issues, we have to first acknowledge that the media is going to be controlled by people in power. In the United States, what that really means is that you're dealing with a consortium of banks, of hedge funds, and you know quite quite a quite a few people uh, that are dictating the conversation because so much of the media that you see, the mainstream media, is essentially controlled by a few major corporations, and therefore the shareholders of those corporations. Which, you know, you can look at that and and go back to these private banks, and then you can try to make a connection between, say, um, a bank that's, that's been around for quite some time, like the Rothschilds Bank. But if you actually look at it today, the Rothschilds Bank is one of the smaller private banks in Europe. There's about at least 10 very well-known European banks that, are, that cater to private rich clients that favor secrecy, probably because on some level they profited off of World War II, and perhaps even World War, probably World War I. And you know, you would imagine that, you know, if you're one of the smaller banks within that, that top 10 spectrum, you can also imagine just how ridiculous it would be to blame a certain group for media concentration of ownership. And this is all readily available. You can go online and you know, look up a, a Bloomberg story about this. And these are all facts and they can all be verified. And, you know, in fact, if you want to look at the banking control, you, you know, which again dovetails with media advertising and therefore media ownership, and media sustenance. You know, in fact, post-World War II, the major banks were not controlled by, but essentially moved forward by people with the last names Young and Morgan. We know about Morgan, that's J.P. Morgan. I suppose if you wanted to really sort of look at media control and media ownership, it has to be within context. And, you know, people sort of have the right idea when they talk about this idea of banking concentration of ownership. Uh, and they sort of have the right idea when they associate that with media ownership. But what they're really talking about is the failure of journalism. They're talking about the failure of the writers to do their job, of the authors to do their job.
And because of that failure, you look at what's happening today in many places all over the world where you have a concentration of ownership. That concentration of ownership has resulted in the status quo trying to use their access to your eyeballs and your ears and your mind not to give you the truth, but really to, to maintain their own status quo because you have so much, so much inequality all over the world that you don't necessarily have a system that's designed, at least not on the mainstream level, to find the truth. And, you know, you can look at that, <clears throat> you know, you can look at that just in defense spending. If you have a, a $100 billion contract, you can only imagine how easy it would be simply to funnel uh, through a special purpose vehicle or some off the, you know, or on the books, but, you know, or opaque, you know, vehicle, accounting vehicle, you know, $100 million just to say, you know, do whatever it is you wanted to whether it's to hire a consultant, whether it's to maintain existing relationships, uh, whether it's to promote certain people in certain positions, uh, whether it's to buy ownership in a media company, even local, state or federal, um, you know, that, that operates locally, state, you know, nationally, or, or you know, on a statewide level, and try to boost your own people into those positions. And in the past, I, I think most people didn't necessarily mind a lot of the a concentration of ownership because they really felt like the structure, the overall structure was designed to promote the people that were at the top based on merit. And so people don't necessarily mind concentration of ownership if they believe the people in power are, you know, either are more wise uh, or more qualified than they are. And what I think we have now is, you know, sort of this idea that people have given up on the idea, uh, on the notion that the concentration of ownership structure that we see now is based on merit. And that's causing all kinds of problems within the same paradigm of heavily concentrated ownership across the board, property, media, and so on. So hopefully this gives you an idea of, you know, number one, why journalism is so important. And, you know, number two, you know, why we keep seeing these sort of historical, um, this, this historical demagoguery against particular groups. And it happens because on some level, like I said, it's logical, but it's really based on an advertising algorithm that tries to target people in different places. It's based on a fact that some, you know, one major bank uh, has been controlled by a particular group of people, but that's actually one of the smaller banks uh, across the board. And then it's not even, you know, again, it's one of the smaller banks. So overall, you know, it doesn't seem like this is, should be that difficult to resolve. Or at least because now that we have a now that we're on a common platform, we know that we need, we need we need to have journalism. We need to have a better educational system. By the way, if you don't have good journalism, I don't see how you can have a good educational system because you're probably going to be repeating the same lies and the same outdated you know, ideas that have been passed down to you by whoever happened happened to be in power before. Which means typically whoever won a war before you showed up, and you know that's that's one of the reasons why. You, know, you hear about revolutionaries burning books. They're not burning books because <laughs> they're anti-book or anti-knowledge. Um, there's a, a racist sort of propaganda against Chairman uh, or Premier Mao of China that alleges that he was burning books. And this is designed to make him look like he's anti-intellectual. In fact, Mao was a poet and a librarian. And so you couldn't, it couldn't have been anti-book. What, what, so what, what ends up happening is that, you know, again, the people that come into power by revolution get there and, and, were, and believe themselves to be justified in a violent revolution because in many cases, the, the propaganda or the media was biased against them. And so when they're burning the books, they're not burning what they consider to be accurate knowledge. They're burning fake news. So that hopefully gives you a logical explanation of why some you hear about book burning, especially within a revolutionary context. So everything makes sense. And everything again goes back to this idea of, you know, journalists having a hard time operating within a structure of concentration of ownership that is trying to do whatever it takes to maintain it's the same ownership structure.